First Baptist, First Baptist Church. It's great to be here with everyone this morning. It's good to see everyone here in the building. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those guests watching online. Um, before I go too far, I'd just like to say that I was doing some renovations at my house this weekend, and I pinched a rib. So if you hear me cough or see me wince, it's not a COVID cough. It's a pinched rib cough. Um, okay, now that that's taken care of. So this morning's message, um, if those of you who received the weekly flyer, uh, this week we received it on Friday, and it was entitled God of Hope. And it reads, have you ever felt discouraged? Have you ever thought that there is no way out? Have you ever wondered where God is in the toughest of times? Well, there's hope. And this morning, Kevin will be continuing the Short Burks Books of the Bible series, looking at the God of hope, the one who keeps his promises. So that's what we'll be going through this morning, church. Um, I would also like to point out uh, Ticket Leap, which if you vi visit First Baptist Church, sorry, firstb.ca, and click on Ticket Leap, you can sign up there to join us live in person. So if you are able to and willing and aren't susceptible, don't have any underlying health concerns, you can join, uh, join us here at First B every Sunday morning by signing up at Ticket Leap on our website, firstb.ca. Um, also, brand new this coming week, we will have simulated live services coming Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday at 7 p.m. And that can be found at firstb.ca. So if you miss Sunday live stream or there's technical difficulties, um, or if work gets in the way and you work shift work so you can't make it on Sunday, this is a great opportunity to uh, watch the service over again. So again, that's Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday at 7 p.m. Uh, and that's on, found on first, at firstb.ca. I'd also like to touch base on uh, online services for Kids Church. So again, in that weekly email flyer, there'll be the last link in that. If you click on it, it brings you to a page uh, where you can find online services for kids. So because kids cannot, we, we currently can't uh, hold Kids Church at our church, this is a great opportunity for those parents who have young ones uh, and would like for them to uh, still go through Sunday school. There's plenty of resources there. That can be also found on our First Beers page and uh, our Facebook page at First Baptist Church. Um, and this morning, Wi-Fi is turned off for those of us in-house. We're trying to use all the bandwidth that we can um, for our live stream so those watching online will be able to see the whole service. So for those of you who have phones, please turn your data on and don't use the church Wi-Fi. Um, before I turn it over to the worship team, I'd just like to read a scripture verse in Hebrew chapter 10. So verse 23 reads, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength the rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God will reign forever. I hope I strong in Thanks you all grow weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. Strength 
to rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength to rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. The everlasting God, the everlasting God, you do not think you won't grow weary. You're the defender of the weak, you comfort those in need, you lift us up on wings like he goes you are the everlasting god the everlasting god you do not think you will go weary you're the defender of the weak you comfort those in need you lift us up like he Good morning, church. Good to see you, everybody. I'm Kevin. I'm the lead pastor here. Andrew's leading us this morning on acoustic. We've got Jason, we've got Gwen, we've got Gord. Just a friendly reminder that uh, we are recommending, along with the government, that you don't sing. Uh, we're not going to throw you out if you do, but uh, at any rate, uh, we're here to worship the Lord. We don't need to sing to do that. Hopefully you're encouraged by what's happening here today through the songs and the scripture reading, uh, through the preaching of God's word. And I want to read Psalm 62, which just reminds us of the hope that we have in Jesus. It says this, truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down? This leaning wall, this tottering fence, surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouth they bless, but in their hearts they curse. And this is the key part. Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Hopefully you can say that this morning. Our hope is you. To you, O oh Lord, I lift my soul. In you, O oh God, I place my trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Don't let my enemies triumph over me my hope is in you show me your way it's got me in truth for all my days my hope is in you i am oh lord filled with your Oh God, my salvation, will guide my life and rescue me. My broken spirit shouts, my mended heart cries out. For all my days. 
right, do you agree with that? Clap your hands. Again, First Baptist, how amazing is it to be here this morning, worshiping the God of heaven. I'm so thankful to be here with everyone here in the house, and again, thank, thanks, thanks to you who tuned in uh, online and are worshiping at your homes or your cottages or wherever you have Wi-Fi. Um, so this morning, uh, this is the time when we would normally pass the plates for donations, but because of COVID, we won't be doing that. So if you do have donations, I'd like to make note that there is a donations box at the back of the church. Um, you can donate there. No, other options of donating are online via Tidely. So you can either go to the church app or go to our firstb.ca uh, website and click on the donation uh, icon there to donate via Tidely. You can also donate in-house at the church to Kelly by visiting the church during office hours to drop off a check. Kelly will be here for that. Um, we're so thankful for the finances that God gives us, and uh, we're so very thankful for the support that we have here in our community um, from everyone here, everyone watching online, and those of us who may not be tuned in this morning but support First Baptist Church. So thank you from me and from all of our church family. Um, this morning, we'd like to uh, go to prayer now, and uh, so why don't we just bow with me and let's pray over some of these things. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for our First Baptist Church family. Thank you for this town that we live in and uh, that you've implemented your church here, Lord. Um, I'm just so thankful for the people that we have here. Um, 
and thank you that they support this church, Lord. Thank you that you provide for us, ultimately, that you give us jobs that we can go and work, and uh, you give us a heart to give back to you, Lord, the, what, you, what, you would, what you've already given to us. Um, so it's, we're very thankful for that, Lord. I think of uh, the coronavirus now and the times that we have, Lord, all of those people who are shut in and can't come out to church, or maybe those who are shut in and don't have access to internet and aren't able to uh, worship online with us, Lord, I just pray that you would wrap your loving arms around them and, and let your presence be felt by them this morning. Lord, let your peace uh, come upon them. Um, Lord, I think of all of the marriages in our church and just the relationships between siblings and parents and, and, and children. And uh, in this time that we're all a little more cooped up together and maybe have cabin fever, I pray that you would uh, continue to strengthen our relationships with one another, Lord, with our wives, um, with, our, with, with, with the husbands, with children and parents, siblings. Lord, that we wouldn't... Um, we would get along. We would um, we would seek seek your face in this and and find the peace that we need and um, the patience that we need sometimes with one another in you. Um, Lord, I'm also thankful for the finances again that you've provided for us. Um, and I pray for those folks during this time who are hurting financially. Um, I know that a lot of people lost their jobs because of the coronavirus, and uh, Lord, I'm thankful for uh, CERB and the government impl implementations that, they, that our Canadian government has provided uh, to subsidize those who have lost their jobs. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue to work with our leaders uh, to guide and direct them, give them wisdom, Lord. Think of our Premier, our Prime Minister, and all of those serving uh, locally in Timmins as, as well as uh, federally at the highest level, Lord. And I also pray, pray for the leaders of this church that you would continue to guide and direct our, our ways, uh, and Lord, that we would always seek to honor you first, and, um, and we thank you for all these things. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this next song is called My Worth is Not in What I Own, and it's a great reminder that as we go through tough times like this, it doesn't matter how much stuff you have, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's good to have a house over your head, it's good to have clothes on your body, but those things ultimately don't matter. What matters is what lasts, what's eternal. And this is a song that kind of fleshes that out as we think about what matters in life is Christ, Him crucified, and a relationship with Him. And hopefully you have that this morning. If you don't, uh, turn and trust Christ today. Uh, he is worth following. So hum along if you like as we sing My Worth Does Not and What I Own. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or Christ that flowed at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him. Fade and die, fame, youth, and beauty, but life eternal calls to us. I will not boast, can well hold.
Jesus here that I confess my worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust. Grab a seat. Ben, come on, read scripture for us. Morning, everyone. It's a blessing to be back with you today. Um, my name's Ben. We'll be reading from Obadiah, verses 15 through 21. If you could turn with me there. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. Just as you drank on my holy hill, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and drink and be as if they had never been. But on Mount Zion will be deliverance. It will be holy, and Jacob will possess his inheritance. Jacob will be a fire and eat Joseph a flame. Esau will be stubble and they will set him on fire and destroy him. There will be no survivors from Esau. The Lord has spoken. People from the Negev will occupy the mountains of Esau, and people from the foothills will possess the lands of the Philistines. They will occupy the fields of Ephraim and Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. This company of Israel, Israelites, Israel, Israelite exiles who are in Canaan will possess the land as far as Zarephath, and exiles from Jerusalem who are in Seraphat, Sepharad, will possess the towns of the Negev. Deliverers, deliverers will go up on Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. This star destroyer is closing in, just a matter of time now. Stormtroopers will board our ship, we might not make it out. So I'll record this message with these secret plans. And then send these droids to Tatooine, the rest is in your hands. Obi-Wan, you're my only hope. my only hope my father begs of you to help him with his struggle in this war he needs someone strong and wise with experience like yours and this vital information it's stored inside our two it needs to get to him on all to run it all depends on you Obi-Wan, you're my only hope, Obi-Wan, in case you didn't know, this is our most desperate hour, this isn't just for show, help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my
All right. So how many of you are Star Wars fans? Come on. Some of your closet Star Wars fans. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Our family's a big, huge Star Wars fan. That's why you got to watch that. Uh, if Obi-Wan Kenobi, though, is your only hope, you are in big trouble. Okay? He's fictional. Didn't really happen. Star Wars. I don't know. might blow some of your minds. All right. But... Uh, this morning, we want to make sure that we're going to the only one who can give us hope, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so we're going to be taking a look at uh, the fact that God is our only hope, and how do we get there? How do we trust him through our most desperate times? That's where we're headed this morning. And so hopefully you have your Bibles open to the book of Obadiah, and we're looking at the last section, verses 15 to 21. And uh, as we get into this idea of hope, many of you I know are, are, or maybe you know of people who are struggling with things like depression, struggling with things like discouragement, struggling with things like job loss, struggling with family fights and squabbles, struggling with things like death. Uh, if, again, if COVID has done nothing else, it's taught us how short life is, right? It's reminded us that we're not in control and that we need to turn to the God of hope. He's the only one who can give us hope. And so we have so many problems in life. I don't know what all your problems are. You probably have a list of them. God is your only hope. Remind yourself that regularly. That's what God's word continually turns us to. It turns us to the fact that God is our only hope and we need to trust and turn to him. And so I love these verses in Psalm 33, 20 to 22. They say this, we wait in hope for the Lord. I mean, right now that's what we're doing, right? We're waiting. We're waiting in hope for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And so my question for you this morning is this. It's going to come up shortly, hopefully. Next slide. For some reason, this is not going. All right, next slide. Uh, it says this. This is the question. Where's your hope? Where is your hope placed in? Uh, I know many people place their hope in uh, the medical system, right? We're hoping that uh, at some point in time we're going to get a cure. Well, that could be years away. We have no idea. If your hope is in the medical system, uh, you have no hope at all. All right? How about this? Is your hope in your education, right? Going off to school. Uh, my child is supposedly going to university this fall. All right? Having online courses, perhaps. If your hope is in education, good luck. How about money or things? If your hope is in money or things, I mean, some of you have lost your job and you're on COVID and thankful for that. But if your hope is in money and things, uh, you know what happens to those things? They, they rust, they spoil, they fade, they eventually turn to dust. Good luck if your hope is in those things. How about your family? This is a tough one. I know if you're married, some of your hope is in your spouse. I mean, just... X that right now, okay? Your spouse is not Jesus. They can't save you, all right? Uh, you got no hope there either, or your kids, or your mom and dad, all right? No hope there. Our hope can only and ever be in God and Him alone, because all these things that we just mentioned and more, they will fail, fail you, they will fade, they will spoil. And so if our hope is in those things, we've got to transfer our hope. And so maybe this morning you've realized that your hope is in some things that shouldn't be, and it's time to transfer your hope to where it should be in Christ and him alone. And so as we continue on our series, which is the short books of the Bible that pack a big punch, let's see if we can remember our theme verse. Uh, it's from 2 Thessalonians 5.16. Again, it's two words. Uh, you can say this together sort of softly, all right? Are we on the count of three? We'll say it together. See if you can remember what it is. One, two, three. Rejoice. Always. Not bad, not bad. All right, let's try it one more time for those of you who didn't remember. All right, on the count of three, 2 Thessalonians 5, 16, 1, 2, 3, rejoice always. All right, again, no matter what the circumstances are, we can rejoice because God is in control. He loves us. He has a plan for our lives. So here's where we're going this morning. Our big idea for this morning. Here it is. It is this. So this is your first fill in the blank. If you're filling in the blanks on the app or uh, online, you can fill in this first blank that is this, the God of hope will keep his promises. The God of hope will keep his promises. When God promises something, how many of you believe he's coming through? Raise your hands, double hands. All right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's true, right? God, when he promises, will come through. And now, it might not come true uh, through, I should say, when you want it to come through, but God's promises always come through. They always come true. 
So the God of hope will keep his promises. And so when we think about biblical hope, we need to, here's the definition of biblical hope, right? It is something that we can hold on to knowing that it will happen. So let me give you an illustration. When we think of hope, we think of things like, uh, I don't know if you saw my pictures from my anniversary. I got to drive a, uh, a very expensive car. Uh, it was a Mercedes car. It cost $200,000. I could say, I hope I will one day own that car, but it will never happen. Well, we all know that's true, right? It will never happen. I hope it does, but it will never happen. That's when we think of hope, we kind of think of like a, it's like a Christmas wish list, right? That's kind of what we think about hope. But when the Bible talks about hope, it's something that is a guarantee. It's something that we can expect that will happen. Why? Because God is the one who promised that it will happen. And so our hope is not in the thing that will happen. Our hope is in the one who said it will happen. The one whose word never fails. So I hope you catch the difference there. It's not in the thing, it's in the person who says it's going to happen. And so biblical hope is a confident expectation of what God has promised. And it's strength. The, hope, the strength of hope is in God himself, in his character, in God's faithfulness. Because God never fails to keep his promises. And so as we hope, we wait. As we Go through times of trouble. We wait. We hope in the Lord. And in the waiting, which is where we're at right now, what are we waiting for, church? We're waiting for the something of Jesus. Anybody want to throw that out there? The return of Jesus. That is our great hope. We are waiting for the return of Jesus. We hope to look forward to our resurrection hope. And 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says this really well. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men, all women, most miserable. If Jesus is only good for the here and now, he's just a get healthy, wealthy, and happy kind of thing, then we are the most miserable people in the world, is what Scripture teaches. But thanks be to God, it's far more than that. So yes, God gives us hope now, but there's hope for eternity. There is life after death. We're going to live with him forever in a world that is without COVID, without disease, without destruction, all these things. This is what we get to look forward to. Most of all, Jesus face to face, right? This is our resurrection hope that we get to look forward to. And hopefully that gives you hope today. That as you're going through the stuff you're going through, don't keep your eyes on the circumstances. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the hope that is to come in Christ. And so the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope for the future. And so there's more for us than plagues and just living day by day. There's more than ceasing to exist when this life is over. There's more than just being born, living, dying, and then that's it. There's more to it than that. We have a hope to look forward to, a confident hope to keep look forward to. And my hope, haha, pun intended, uh, is that today that you will be encouraged to live out the hope that you have in Jesus at your homes, at your workplaces, at the grocery store, wherever you find yourself, you're going to live that hope out. And that people are going to wonder, hey, why is this, that person glowing in a time of despair and depression and anxiety and crazy times? Because we have our hope rooted in Christ and him alone. And so as we get to Obadiah, uh, God is moving and working. And he's, this, this last little section of the book is all about hope. Now it looks like doom and, and gloom, right? I mean, where there's, there's these prophecies, uh, judgment is coming, the nation's going to be destroyed, but there's a silver lining that you see in here. And the silver lining is the hope that, yeah, God is going to right all the wrongs. Remember last week we talked about the God who is righteous, right? Justice is going to come. And so as he, as, as things look bad, God is still moving, he's still working, his promises are still unfolding and coming true. And so we're going to take a look at three promises that gave a shot in the arm to God's people in times of trouble, when they desperately needed hope. So let's keep, uh, what's the circumstances we find Israel in? They're exiled right now. They're at their other land. Their capital city has been destroyed. They've been led away as prisoners. I mean, the future did not look good. Just put yourself in their, their circumstances for a second. Imagine yourself chained far away from home, a slave. Your hometown is demolished. And you're like, God, where are you? I, I don't see any hope in this. And Obadiah helps us see the silver lining in the tough circumstances. 
And there's a reminder that no matter the circumstances, we hold on to the God of hope. We hold on to the God of hope. And, and hope will not disappoint us. So this is from Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Hope doesn't disappoint us. Why? Because of who our hope is in. Because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who continues to pump our tires with hope. Right? He's the one who is dwelling in us and he's like, <laughs> all right, pumping our tires up with hope. And so look to him, look to the word to have your hope filled. All right, so here's our, our promise number one as we get to it. One more time. I'm not sure if I'm doing that or you're doing that. Anyways, here's promise number one. God will defeat your enemies. That's found in verses 15 and 16. God will defeat your enemies. This is great news for the people of Israel, right? Uh, we've already established that they've been trapped and enslaved. Uh, this is a people with little to look forward to, with no real hope. And God delivers this promise. I, I like to, I liken it to boomerang justice, right? Uh, do you know what boomerangs do? They, 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 they come back around, right? And so it's boomerang justice. And this is what we see happening. It's kind of like you know, what goes around comes around. All right, it's, a, it's the law of the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's what's happening. And so God's going to defeat Israel's enemies. Let's take a look at verse 15. It says this, As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Now, this is a great line for you who uh, have children and you're parenting. All right, just throw verse 15 out, right? A reminder, if you do this, then it's likely that this is going to happen to you. Just remember, I tell my, my sons all the time, just remember the youngest boy is eventually going to be the largest. And he's going to be able to wail upon you at some time if he so chooses. All right? So just treat him kindly. Treat him nicely. All right? Because he will be a large lad at some point. So this is kind of what this is talking about. In other words, it's you reap what you sow. So little quiz time here, church. Those of you who are gardeners should be able to get this pretty easy. If you throw seeds into the, uh, let me rephrase that. If you throw peas into the ground, what do you get? Come on, you're not very confident, church, here. Come on, you get peas, all right? Uh, if you sow carrots into the ground, what do you get? If you sow stupid into the ground, what do you get? Stupid, okay? Are you following what I'm saying here? If you sow stupid, you will reap stupid, I run into people all the time that wonder, they ask aloud, God, why are you allowing these things to happen? And all we have to do is press reverse and just say, do you remember when you did this? You chose this. That's why you're facing this right now. There's a real world, real world circumstances that come around to bear and bite us in our butt sometimes called boomerang justice. It happens to us and it will happen to God's enemies as well. God will treat his enemies as they treated him and his people. Now, last week we already established that's fair, that's good justice. It's allowed to happen. Verse 16 kind of flushes that out for us a little bit. It says this, talking to Edom in particular, For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they have never been. So I want you to picture a little bit. Uh, have you ever tried drinking from a big, huge bucket before? What happens? Right? You kind of like are gasping for breath. And this is kind of what's happening with Edom. God is delivering this cup of justice to them. And they're like force drinking it. Not a pleasurable experience for the nation. And we need to be reminded that God's wrath is a real thing. Because as Edom and the surrounding nations drank the blood of Israel, so God would force feed them his wrath. Now here's something to keep in mind. This is a true statement. Before Jesus, you and I were blank of God. Fill in the blank. We were enemies of God. We're born into this world as enemies of God in the kingdom of darkness. And so unless we transfer our citizenship from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light through faith in Christ, we are still enemies of God. That is a not good place to find yourself in. Not a good place. And so we need to transfer our citizenship in the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so as enemies of God, we are subject to the wrath of God. God's wrath is on sin and deservedly so. He's a just and holy God and his wrath is on sin. And if we have not transferred our citizenship, it will be on us. Next slide says this in John three thirty six. 
We can go to the next slide there, guys. It says this. He who believes in the Son has what? Everlasting life. And he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but they will see the wrath of God abides on him. Again, not a good place to be. But the good news is when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, the wrath of God is paid for. So when Jesus was on that cross, remember when he said, it is finished? Remember that? That was a legal term which Jesus said, the price has been paid. The wrath of God has been satisfied. And then he rose again to prove it, right? That he was who he was and what he said happened. So that's important for us to keep in mind. For those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus, there is no wrath on us anymore. Now, most of us, and I, I'm going to assume, because most of you are likable people, all right? Most of you probably don't have arch enemies like Edom, right? Who are seeking to devour you, kill you, hand you over to the authorities. Most, any, anybody have one of those people? Probably not, right? So we're, we're pretty good here in Canada. We live pretty good lives. We don't have too many enemies. Perhaps you have an internet troll or two right? Who kind of likes to throw their shade on you on Facebook. Isn't Facebook a lovely thing? All right. Anyways, I digress. Uh, but here's something to keep in mind, church. Our greatest enemies that we have, have already been defeated at the cross. All right. Amen. Indeed. They are sin and they are death. Those are humanity's greatest weaknesses because none of us can solve them. We have that problem our entire lives, but Jesus has solved them at the cross. And so let's just define this for a second. Let's go to the next uh, slide here, because some people are unsure of what this word sin means. Uh, I don't know if you ever talked about uh, with people you're witnessing, you're sharing, them, like, what is sin? I have no idea. Some people are, do not know what that word means. Uh, we're living in a very post-Christian culture, so we need to define that. So here's the definition of sin. It's a pretty working, easy definition. It's anything that we do, say, or think that displeases God. It is essentially disobeying God. That's essentially what sin is. It's rebellion against him. It's doing our own thing. Hebrews 8, 12, this next slide, says this. It says, I will forgive their iniquities and will remember their sins no more. That's the good news. Through the cross, Jesus forgives us and he will remember them no more. So keep this in mind. If you're struggling with past sin, if you're feeling condemnation for sin that's already forgiven, it's not coming from God. It's coming from where? It's coming from sin, from, from some Satan. You're right. It's coming from the devil. He likes to heap on condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The sin is gone. It's forgiven. It's cast in the deepest sea. All right. Somewhere in Mary in his trench, there's a big, long, oh, there's a big vault with all of our, I, I'm just joking a little bit, but... Uh, it's gone, all right? It's forgiven. God does not hold us accountable for it anymore. Yes, we still sometimes face consequences, but they're gone. They're not condemning us anymore. And I love what uh, Isaiah 25, 8 says about death as, as our, other, our other enemy. Let's go to the next slide there. It says this in Isaiah 25, 8. He, God, will swallow up death in what? Victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And so... Our victory over these things is not necessary right now, but it will be. And so as we wait, what do we do? We hope in the Lord. We look forward to that day when these things will be dealt with fully and complete. Now, you can still have victory over sin. Thanks be to God through his word. You put on the armor of God through his spirit. You use the word of God as a weapon to fight. You can still have victory over sin. But... Let's look forward to that day when sin and death will be fully dealt with. All right, promise number two is this. Next slide. It says, God will deliver you. The fill in the blank should be deliver. I'm pretty sure I forgot to underline that. God will deliver you. Now, delivering is one of God's specialties. Let's think of the times when God did some delivering, right? Uh, he delivered the Israelites from where? Anybody? Egypt, right? From slavery. He delivered Daniel from where? The lions, right? And we've already talked about he delivers us from God's wrath. There's so many other things that we can talk about where God delivers us. Let's take a look at verse 17. It says this, But in Mount Zion there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy, and the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. And so verse 17 is actually the climax of the book of Obadiah. 
Things go from bleak to bright here. They go from desperate to not so desperate anymore. And so the nation of Israel isn't just delivered, but restored as well. We see this remnant of God's people that he's preserving, that they're going to make it through, that will endure, that will escape. But more than that, they will thrive in the promised land. Do you see what verse 17 says? It says, they will possess their own possessions. That's an allusion to the promised land. That God says, yeah, the promise is coming. Just hold on. Just wait a little bit longer. The promise is coming. It will be fulfilled. And so what God has promised, he will deliver on. And the hope of, of this deliverance unfolds over a kind of a, a period of time, right? So we see this immediate deliverance from the people uh, from captivity in Babylon. They were relatively immediately uh, delivered and restored there. And then we see Jesus, his delivery at the cross. And eventually we're going to see deliverance and restoration when Jesus returns. Now, Obadiah is a book of prophecy as well. And this might fascinate some of you. Some of you might know this might be old hat, but it's pretty cool that when God promises, he does deliver. So let's go to the next slide. The nation of Israel was born in a day. Anybody know what year that was? Close to 1947. 1948. Uh, it's also, ironically, the year my father was born. All right, so that's a little bit of a pastoral point quiz trivia time that you might get at some point. All right, anyways, so 1948, Israel was born in a day. Right now, if you know the, the history around this, Israel was without a nation until 1948. God promised right here in Obadiah that they would possess their possessions. What do we see happening in a day? And this is You'll have to look at the history of as kind of how it all formed and shaped. God was clearly at work here. Israel became a nation again. This prophecy was fulfilled. Isaiah 66, verse 8, which I think is on the next slide. If you can go to the next slide, there it is. No, go back one. Sorry, it was right there. It says this. Who has ever heard of such things? Again, another prophecy of the nation being born. Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day? Or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor that she gives birth to her children. And the next slide is the picture of the Palestine Post of what happened in 1948. So you can just flash that in a second there, guys. Next slide. There it is. State of Israel born. So God's at work. He's delivering on his promises. This isn't quite fulfilled fully yet, though. Because ultimately, when God returns, heaven is going to be on earth. The nation, so let me rephrase that, the new Jerusalem is going to be coming down. God's going to rule and reign in, on earth with his people, or with us. That's going to happen. That's when the, this fully, completely, this prophecy is going to be fully, completely restored. So it's important for us to keep in mind that when God promises future events, they're going to happen. And it does. And it, and it did. All right, here we go. Let's keep on keeping on. As we get to look forward to this delivery that God is going to deliver us to, we also are looking forward to the return of Jesus. We're looking forward to when we're going to possess the land. We're going to be God's people. We're going to be living with him. Something to look forward to. Great hope to look forward to. Here's promise number three. Next slide, please. That God will establish his kingdom. So verse 21, I say verse 15, I'm sorry, tells us this. That the day of the Lord is coming. Right? There's a, an old song that goes, the, the king is coming, right? You might have remembered uh, the, the, the movie series, The Lord of the Rings. What's the third one? It's the return of the king, right? That's what that slide is up there on the screen. We get to look forward to the return of Jesus. This is our great hope. And so next slide says this, Titus 2, 13. One more, sorry. We are awaiting our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, whether you think this verse in particular refers to the rapture, whether you think it refers to the second coming, the point remains the same. Our great hope is the return of Jesus. That's, that is our hope. And as we go into the world around us, that's the hope that we have that nobody else has. That's the hope that we can bring to our workplaces, that we can bring into our families, that we can remind people that there is something to look forward to. It is not just what you're experiencing now and all the junk that you're experiencing, but Jesus is going to return and set up his kingdom. That's the blessed hope. And so 
This hope, according to Titus 2.13, says that this hope is blessed, not cursed. It says that this hope is visible. It's not secret. This hope is glorious. It's a celebration to end all celebrations. And for the follower of Jesus, this day will be awesome and amazing. But for those who aren't following Jesus, it's not going to be great. So let's go to verse 15 for a second. And then the next slide, it says this, For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. The day of the Lord is near. It's coming. The day of the Lord is a day of judgment. You can read about that in the book of Revelation. It unpacks it for us, uh, the future that is coming. Because here's what we need to know. That when Jesus returns, it's not just to set up his kingdom, it's also to be judge. And I remember having a conversation with a, with a pastor, actually, this is a number of years ago. We sat down at convention, and uh, he was, we, we were discussing, and, and, and he was trying to convince me, and, and rightly so, that Jesus is love. And it's true that Jesus is love, right? Hopefully you all agree with that. But Jesus is also judge. Jesus wears two hats. He is love, but he's also judge. And in his loving, he's also judging, right? That's part of who God is and who his character is. And we need to keep in mind that Jesus is going to be those who don't put their faith in him. He's going to be their judge. And so one day, the Bible tells us that you will be standing before God. You will answer every word that you have ever spoken, every thought that you've ever thought, every deed you've ever done, you will be accountable for. Or Jesus will have paid for those things. Those are the two options. Now, I don't know about you, but I know what goes on in this head of mine. I know what this mouth says, and I certainly know what these hands do. And I don't want to be held accountable for those things. Thanks be to God through Jesus, I don't have to be. Because they're forgiven, they're paid for, they're gone. And so the bottom line is this. Do you want to experience the dreadful day of the Lord, or do you want that day to be a celebration? There's no in-between. Those are the two options. So verse 21 tells us this. Saviors shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be whose? It shall be the Lord's. And so let's keep in mind, the Lord right now reigns from Mount Zion. Right now, God's reigning, even though it doesn't look like it, because he's given temporary control over to this world, to Satan. And he's going to take that back one day. It's already, Satan's already been defeated at the cross. He's kind of just last throws. He's trying to rule what he can, when he can. God's going to set up his kingdom. And verse 21 is a little bit confusing because it says, Savior shall go up to Mount Zion. Now, there's a couple of options here. It could be referring to the 12 disciples who will reign with Christ. It could be referring to angels, but it could also be referring to followers of Jesus who will reign with Jesus. And, and my suggestion is it's the last one. It's the third thing. Because the Bible tells us over and over again, followers of Jesus, you and I, we get to reign with Christ for eternity. That's a cool thing, right? Now, some of us might be reigning uh, the winteriest part of the world. I don't know where that is. Tim, let's, let's say Timbuktu. Because our, 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 our reigning is actually related to how we are faithful on this earth. So how we serve Jesus now determines where we get to reign forever in some way, shape, or form. I don't know how it all works. I'm just kind of throwing that out there. Maybe it's Timbuktu. Maybe you get to, I don't know, where's the, where's the great destination? Now, there's no great destination now, but like maybe you get to rule Timmins. That'd be kind of cool, I guess, ish. All right. I don't know. The point is this, is that we are going to reign and rule with Jesus. He's going to give us rewards based on how we have served him in the here and now, right? So remember that verse that Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servants. That's related to a parable where one guy was faithful, two guys were faithful, one guy wasn't. The two guys that were faithful were given more. The one guy that wasn't faithful was given, well, nothing. He got into the kingdom by the skin of his teeth, but the rewards were few and next to none. And so as we serve God in here and now, let's Keep in mind, the Bible actually gives us incentives to keep in mind that as we serve, we're storing up treasure in heaven. As we witness and tell people about Jesus, we're storing up treasure in heaven. As we give, we're storing up treasure in heaven. We're building not our kingdom. Whose kingdom are we building? The Lord's, right? That's the point. So Revelation eleven fifteen says this. Next slide, please. It says, 
The kingdom of the world has begun the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. In Philippians, we see every knee bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. It will be a kingdom that will never end. And if you go back to the Lord's prayer, what does Jesus pray? Next slide says this. What? Thy kingdom, what? Come. Come. Thy will be done. We're looking forward to the return of the kingdom. That's what this prayer is about, reminding us, hey, yeah, this is our destiny. This is our future. We want it now. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. So are you praying for God's kingdom to come? Are you looking forward to that blessed hope? It's so easy to get distracted by this world, eh? right? I mean, it's really easy to get distracted by the here and now, but we need to keep our focus on the coming king and his kingdom and building it. And so, next slide says this. What's our response? Now, if you don't know the king yet, if you're not sure whether you're going to be in the kingdom, your response needs to be this, repent. Turn from your sin and trust God. Bow the knee to Jesus Christ. He is the king of kings. He will be reigning. And the question is, are you going to be reigning with him or not? So put your faith in him. The Bible makes it pretty clear. Admit you can't do it on your own. Believe that Jesus died in your place and rose again and see, confess him as Lord. Make him the Lord of your life. ABC, pretty simple. But you need to humble yourself to do it. And be willing to trust Christ and him alone for your salvation. So maybe you need to repent this morning. And if you do need to do that, do it right now. Don't wait. Don't wait. But if you have already repented, right, what do you need to do? Let's go to the next slide. If you're a follower of Jesus, and we think about hope, and we need to think about waiting, we think about the kingdom, you need to do this. You need to be ready to answer. Because we have a world of people without hope. And we need to be ready to answer. So 1 Peter 3.15 says, In your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But, catch the butt here, do this how? In gentleness, in other words, don't take your Bible, close it, start thumping over the head and say, you need to believe in Jesus because you're only hope. All right, that's not going to work. All right, be gentle, do it with respect. I can tell you, if you're ready to give an answer, there will always be opportunity. So all you need to do is ask God for opportunity because he will grant it. He wants you to share the hope that's within you. So just ask for the opportunity. Ask for the boldness to walk in that opportunity and then take the opportunity. So be ready to answer, church, for the hope that lies within you. And then third response, and Sam alluded to that at the beginning, which is great. He and I didn't have that uh, know-how, but it's just great how God works. So let's go to the next slide. Our third response is this, is to hold on to the hope that we have. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly. Do you know what that means? Think of a car, right? Car swerves like this, right? Get out of control. Let's hold unswervingly, in other words, straight line, right? To the hope we profess. Why? For he who promised is what? Is faithful. Yeah. So our hope is not, is rooted, let me rephrase that. Our hope is rooted in the God who is faithful to keep his promises. So some of you this morning might be like clinging to your hope, like with fingernails, right? Or by the hair on your chin, 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 right? And that's okay. You're still hanging on. That's good. Hold on and swervingly. But this is part of the reason why we do church, Right? Even socially distanced, we can still love each other, pray for each other, encourage each other in our hope. And so if you are struggling, reach out. Just, I mean, we have the online prayer thing happening for a reason, to reach out. Hey, I'm struggling. I need prayer. And church, if somebody asks you to pray for them, again, let me remind you, don't say, I'll go home and do that because no, you won't. Right? You'll forget. Pray with them right now. Encourage them in the here and now and say, can I pray with you right now? And most people, like 99.9% will say, yeah, even unbelievers will say that. Guarantee you, they want the hope that you have. They need it. And so as we pray with them, as we encourage them, they're going to be encouraged to keep on keeping on. And so are you. So let's hold on swervingly to the hope that we have. Part of the reason, oh, I already said that. So let me close with a couple of verses that will just encourage us in our hope. And then we'll listen to one more song. So next slide says this. It's going to say this. Next slide says something. There it is. All right. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Great verse that just reminds us where our hope should be in. 
says this, those who hope in the Lord will what? Renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. All these things happen for those who hope in the Lord. So put your hope in him. And then the last slide, Romans 15, 13. We're going to say this together-ish. All right? I'm not sure how to encourage us to do this, but like, Maybe don't yell it, I guess, is the, maybe the thing I'll, I'll say. All right? So we're going to say it together because it's a great way to end. Great prayer that, that ends, almost ends the book of, of Romans. Uh, it just reminds us of the hope that we have. And so let's, uh, let's stand up. All right? Maybe we'll say this together, starting with the word may. All right, here we go. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, pray that you'd help us to hold unswervingly to the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for the reality that you conquered death, that you are reigning right now at the, the right hand of the Father. God, that you have plans for us. You have a future for us. We hold on to that hope of your return. Lord, help us to have an answer for that hope when we need it, not only for ourselves, but for those we run into. Uh, and Lord, just help us to hold on. We need that encouragement. We need that kick in the pants sometimes. Uh, we need that rebuke sometimes, Lord, just hold on. And so, Lord, for those who are struggling to hold on this morning, pray that you give them that extra measure of strength, that they would be able to put their hope in you, that they would be able to soar like eagles, that they would be able to continue on to run and not grow faint. And so we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you that uh, your promises are yes and amen in Jesus. And thank you that you're the God of hope. So help us to take that hope with us through our week and be the people of God who have hope with us. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as Kevin said, um, certainly Jesus is our only hope, and so we're going to finish the service off um, with a song called In Christ Alone, which is all about um, exactly what Kevin spoke about, that uh, our hope is found in Christ, that um, when we abide in him, um, we eventually see glory. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest dry and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still and striving seas, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I see. In Christ alone, who took our flesh, fullness of God in helpless grace, this gift of love. Righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ. His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. In earth and form, in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, his curse has lost its grip on me. For I am His, and He is mine, bought with the precious blood of God. No guilt in mine, no fear in hell. This 
is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final prayer Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from this hand No scheme of man can never pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of God, I see. Hopefully you're encouraged today knowing that we serve the God who is the God of hope and go live out hope as uh, you leave this morning. Just a couple of reminders as we depart. Uh, we need to make our way out this door over here to my left, your right, potentially, unless you're over here and to your left as well. Uh, you're going to make your way down the stairs, keeping spaced out, go around the corner by the bathrooms and out that door. And uh, you can hang out outside if the weather is going to cooperate. Uh, we do have a Q&A time for those who are online or in-house. If you have any questions about today's message, uh, feel free to hang around and ask uh, for a few minutes to do that. And so let me close off with this blessing on you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And everybody said, amen. God bless you all. Hopefully see you next week, either online or in person. Take care.